Uh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, here for another session in the study of the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we're going to take up part four of the wasteland, Death by Water. In part three, we had a look at the influence of Buddhism on T.S. Eliot, who saw Buddhism in that section as a system of ethics. That is to say, the Buddha preached to his sermon a code of behavior that he advised his thousand monks to follow uh, that involved suppression of the five senses, that is to say, the physical body, and suppression of the mind. Uh, both the body is on, uh, the five senses are on fire with various passions, and uh, the mind likewise. So to achieve the Buddhist objective of desirelessness, that blessed condition beyond the reach of suffering, uh, it was necessary to cast aside or suppress both the body and the mind. If one could do that, one could form, you might say, a path to the other dimension that Eliot was interested in concerning Buddhism, that is to say, Buddhist metaphysics, which I think are the ultimate subject of part four, Death by Water. By Buddhist metaphysics, we are speaking of the concept of nirvana. And I need to explain the thinking behind these concepts for a moment before we launch into the poem proper. In the original Fire Sermon, uh, at the bottom of the page that I gave you in the file that goes with these lectures, we find the Buddha making a promise to his monks that if they follow his instructions of suppressing both the mind and the body, we can thereby reach the deepest, truest, and only eternal part of the self what Westerners might call the soul, but which Hindus, and the Buddha was a Hindu living in India, what the Hindus call the Atman, A-T-M-A-N, that particle of the universal soul that lives on for all eternity, uh, and which it is the Buddhist or Hindu's purpose to realize, that is to make real, to have contact with, to give full expression to, and indeed to give dominion over his entire being to the Atman, uh, being the object of Buddhist or Hindu worship. Now at the end of the fire sermon then, the Buddha says the following. In conceiving this aversion, for both the five senses, the body, and for the mind, one becomes divested of passion, that is, desire, and by the absence of passion, one becomes free. When he is free, one becomes aware that rebirth is exhausted that one has lived the holy life, and that one is no more for this world. Which is to say, reaching the state of nirvana, this state of oneness with the universal soul, after casting aside the mind and the body, or suppressing them. Reaching that blissful state means that one gets off the wheel of rebirth, one does not have to come back to this world of misery and suffering and live another life incarnated in a mind and a body of temporary um, existence. In the Western view, this state of entering nirvana means oblivion. That is, we have no separate consciousness from the universal soul which in the Buddhist or Hindu view is a state of being in sin, to have a separate identity. Uh, but nonetheless, it is the most desired objective of righteous living. 
Now, as we go to death by water, I do discern this Buddhist concept Nirvana as one way to cope with the wasteland. We ended part three, the fire sermon, with St. Augustine praying to be plucked out of the burning, and with T.S. Eliot noting that the Buddhist and Christian forms of asceticism, of denying the body, uh, seem to meet in this concept of desire to escape the burning of desire. In part three, of course, this is sexual desire above all others. In section four, then, death by water, we meet Phlebas the Phoenician, a character that showed up in some of Eliot's earlier poetry, particularly a poem written in French called Dan le Restaurant, in the restaurant, where Phlebas the Phoenician makes his first appearance. We also remember earlier in The Wasteland that in the Fortune Teller episode, Madame Sesostris advised her client to fear death by water. Uh, in that case, the word fear seems a little misplaced, which is to say, in part one, the burial of the dead, certainly there is fear of death. But Eliot held contradictory views of this subject, as indeed perhaps most of us do in some fashion. Uh, the other side of this view of Eliot's comes in the voice of the Sibyl in that epigraph that introduced the entire poem. When those young men went to this voice of wisdom, the Sibyl, who had immortality, and when the young men asked her, what do you want? Her answer was, I wish to die. If indeed death or oblivion is the only answer to the wasteland, Perhaps it is a welcome relief from that veil of suffering, sin, and sorrow. So coming back now to part four and Phlebas the Phoenician, he is, we are told, a fortnight dead as the poem begins. And therefore he forgot the cry of gulls and the deep sea swell. He was a sailor. The Phoenicians were a commercial people invested in trading around the Mediterranean Sea. We come now to the first of the three false values that dominated the wasteland, which Phlebas now being dead can and does forget. Phlebas a Phoenician a fortnight dead forgot the profit and the loss, the flow of money circulating through the wasteland of ultimate importance in the naturalistic scheme of things, but ultimately of no importance in the final reckoning. Now in the middle of this section, Death by Water, originally it was 10 times longer than it is now before Ezra Pound got out his pruning shears and cut it down to size. So in the middle of this very short, concise poem, we have what looks to me is an inviting set of images welcoming this state of oblivion. A current under sea picked his bones and whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth. That, of course, was the wheel of time turning during his lifetime. But now he is entering the whirlpool. And this is an image that comes up importantly later in Eliot's work, the idea of seeking a still point at the center of the turning world. That is the wheel that the world represents, that the, that the dimension of time represents. The wheel has at its very center a still point that does not turn. In Eliot's view, naturalistically, there is only one way to reach this state of bliss beyond the turning wheel by reaching the center, and that is to die. 
that will get you to the center of the wheel, the still point, where Phlebas now reposes. So Phlebas enters the whirlpool, and here we have the second of those three false values that dominated life in the naturalistic wasteland. Gentile or Jew? Well, back in his earlier life, in the earlier poems, T.S. Eliot took some consolation from his social superiority to the low-class rabble that he describes in a number of poems. The Sweeney's, the Bleistein's, the Greeks and Poles, the recent immigrants, that he could look down on from his perch as a scion of the Blue Blood Eliots of Boston, long established as an upper-class family in that uh, honorable city. Nonetheless, Eliot knew deep down that like the prophet and the loss, being a Gentile or Jew means nothing ultimately. It is a false value. Phlebas is better off for having forgot it. We move in the last two lines of this very short section to the third of these false values, a familiar motif in Eliot's earlier work. He addresses the reader now, O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, which is to say those of us who are still alive in the upper world on the surface of the sea, still um, experiencing our life in this world. You who turn the wheel and look to windward, he has some advice for us. Consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. That is to say, Phlebas was a winner in the sexual selection process or the sexual competition, a supremely important value in the wasteland, but ultimately, once again, a false value. T.S. Eliot feels that if these are the only prevailing values, money, the social hierarchy, success in the sexual competition, then life in the, worth, in the wasteland is not worth living. And so oblivion or the Buddhist nirvana is a welcome alternative as we end section four, death by water. We'll turn next to section five, what the thunder said for his other alternative to the wasteland.